Hey everybody, this is Craig Moser. It is, uh, believe it or not, October the 16th, 2020. Wanted to share some information with you about the markets and maybe the economy. Um, needless to say, it's been quite a year um, and the markets have had quite a bit of volatility lately to the upside, but you can see that there's been uh, some weakness as we get closer to this election time, I think is probably the biggest catalyst there. So here's what we're looking at. The lines that change up and down, green and red, those are the uh, daily values of the S&P 500 index, which a lot of people use as their benchmark for comparison. So 505 companies, um, big, big, substantial companies in the United States, but it is market weighted. And honestly, um, if you take the top 10 stocks in that index, you're looking at close to 30% of the entire value from a uh, index weighting for this um, great index, which is the S&P. So Apple and Microsoft, um, Facebook, uh, the two Googles that are in there, they're called Alphabet now. Those guys carry a lot of weight in this particular index. If you compare that, just for example, to the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and we start to look at things like um, returns really since about the first of the year, we haven't been able to recover yet really in the Dow because it doesn't have as much tech in it. So just understand, that, that probably is a fair, fairly significant um, part of the overall index is this um, uh, tech weighting. All right, so let's just take a look. So we're looking back two years. We happen to have the Dow Jones, which is another significant index. And you can see, um, although that index is up for the two year window, the real question is how much? So as we pull that over, you can see that in the last two years, the Dow has averaged about uh, nine, 9.15, some, something like that, right in this range. And the volatility around that average has been fairly significant. Stayed on cue right in here. So that was the 2019 range, and then popped up above its average return, and then dropped significantly below it, now coming back. So people getting excited about market returns this year, yeah, it's okay. But, but the reality of it is right here, let me get this right. Right there is your beginning of the year. So yeah, we're really not doing anything other than moving from a lower point back up to a more normalized uh, area where we've been in the past. So just take it with a grain of salt that volatility has been significant this year. All of this, mostly has been due to COVID-19. Wow, it's, it's amazing that a, a, a virus could, could do that much damage to an economic system. It blows my mind, really. So if we go back to the S&P a little better, right here's your January point, and you can look at that and say, okay, how come that index is a little better than the Dow? The answer is the technology space. You know, there's very little tech, there's some, but very little tech in, in the uh, Dow compared to the S&P 500. So what is that return right there? Maybe nine, I can't tell, I can't see anymore. Hang on a minute. So 9.54, have a different, different uh, set of glasses on today. Sorry, couldn't find my other one, so I had to get the old ones. And so you can see the returns are okay for the year but nothing stellar, if I can get that right on. So maybe 9.77, 8.77, something like that, with a lot of downside volatility followed by a recovery. So when we look at different parts of a stock market, the S&P 500 are big companies. There are a lot of growth style companies in here like Amazon, you know, Apple, um, all of those guys, AMD, Vertex, some pretty racy stuff and some pretty, you know, boring stuff in there as well, some oil. So, but the tech pulls it along so far this year. If we look, for example, at some different sectors. So if we were looking at the utility sector, which would take in 
Duke Energy, that's a group close to us, you can see that utilities really haven't done great this year. All right, let's take that into account. Let's look at industrials. So in this list might be Caterpillar or Honeywell, one of those great big industrial companies. So this index, although it's recovered, it hasn't made its way back to where it was at the beginning of the year over here. Just trying to take a look at that and be aware. As we look at energy, well, that's gonna look pretty rough. Energy's not doing so hot, primarily because of the commodity oil driving a lot of the oil and oil related companies down much further. So people in that industry are struggling a little bit. When you look at technology, obviously, rock and roll time. Wow, doing fairly good. Looked like the S&P for the most part. So that kind of gives you, if we wanted to overlay that, it'll give you some sort of understanding as to how much of the S&P 500 is due to technology. Very similar. This is the S&P right here. So as we look at different parts of the economy, you can see some are really participating and helping us, and some are hanging in there, and then others are not doing so hot. So discretionary, believe it or not, things like Amazon are in the discretionary space. So um, kind of interesting to see what's happening as we spread out uh, healthcare, you know, and, as we spread out and look at different parts of the overall sectors of the economy. Real estate, looking at real estate, for example, eh, not so good this year. You know, had a pretty good decline and now it's sort of flattened out a little bit. So as you look at different parts, just understand all of this sort of slammed together is what you're looking at on the S&P. So the things that are helping, technology, uh, discretionary, things that are hurting, you know, real estate's not helping much. Energy is probably the biggest drag there, and the other guys are sort of also ran. So bonds, a lot of talk about bonds. Now, one of the things that the government and the Federal Reserve Bank used to either stimulate economy or start to slow us down would be interest rates. So um, this year, interest rates have been dropped very low. So what's happening is, you know, we started out, we had some fear, and all of a sudden we had this really significant drop in the bond market. You go, what the heck was that? These are bonds, they're not supposed to move around like that. Well, uh, they did because, you know, there's a lot of things that go on with the bond market. It's a big market. Uh, banks have to have um, reserves posted every day at the Federal Reserve and this is what it's posted in bonds, not necessarily high yield bonds or corporate bonds, but mostly treasuries, but all of them, all of a sudden, uh, there was a little bit of panic and then the Fed steps in and says, hey, we're backing all these bonds, you guys relax, whatever it takes to keep the bond market uh, level and, and solvent, uh, we're in to do that. So that's sort of what happened here with the bond market when you see that little um, significant down move, which tracked pretty much where the stock market was starting in mid-February and stopping at the end of uh, March. A little weird if you look at treasuries. So these are seven to 10 year treasuries that we can buy in an ETF. I use iShares, but it's Barclays Index, seven to 10 year treasury bonds. So just treasuries, ran up like crazy, a little bit of a jitter, just like the other one, and then flat. So people are still parked out pretty heavily in U.S. Treasuries because of uncertainty over what's going to happen. I mean, there's not much going on, just a very contentious election, um, a pandemic, and, you know, then we have civil unrest. Other than that, things are pretty calm this year. Um, as we look at other parts, gold. Gold was brought up to me yesterday in a conversation, and I'm like, yeah, gold's okay. It ran up, it peaked, and it peaked out 8.4, and it's kind of hanging in there now. So has it made its top? Is it going back down? When you look at the longer term trend, maybe five years on gold, um, it's been up. It's sort of up, sort of, uh, to where it was, say, in 2011. So over here was 2011. There was a lot of negative stuff going on there. Then we've had some pretty good drops. And now 
gold has has ran up and exceeded where it was then and now it's sort of receded some since that point so is has gold made its high we'll see do people look at this as a currency if the dollar devalues probably but is that a good choice we'll see um silver similar people ask me about silver similar but not not quite as good but silver is okay you know, so looking at the precious metals, people are putting money there. You know, the commercials are working good. The world's going to collapse. You better buy gold. Um, so we'll see. Let's talk a little bit about inflation. What's happening <coughs> in our world is that these various central banks have been printing money. Now, I'm going to use um, the U.S. debt clock. Let's make sure we're looking at this. Yep, that looks okay. And um, well, I want you to see some things. Everybody looks at this piece over here, which is hard to look at. We owe from a government $27 trillion. It's a big number and it's running like a freight train now. This year, according to US Debt Clock, our actual spending will, is right now at $7.3 trillion for the year, of which we are running a deficit of 4.2 million. That means that we had money to pay for three of it and the rest of it we put on the credit card, basically. Kind of hard to look at. Here's the part that I want you to think about. When you look at the volume of money, that green paper that floats around in our economic system, the money supply, and there's a big definition for that, but M2 basically is all the cash and currency, all that stuff, credit derivatives, stuff like that. In the year 2000, we had $4.8 trillion worth of money. Look at the line item above that. So I'm, I'm right here, right here. And, we're, and now we have $18.6 trillion worth of currency and cash on hand and all that sort of stuff. So how come? Because they printed more money. So that means that there's more money chasing the stock market. There's more money chasing a piece of real estate or the price of a truck or a McDonald's hamburger inflation. So expect inflation because they keep creating more currency. Enough said on that. Let's look at, uh, for example, let's look at the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve Bank because that's a not so happy thing, but this is what's happening. If you don't understand this economic stuff, you ought to go and look this up. So the Federal Reserve Bank, just like the Bank of England or the Bank of Australia or the Bank of Canada or a People's Bank of China or the Bank of Japan, their central banks um, are supposed to control interest rates, and, and, and create more or less currency. So you can see what they're doing for currency and that's supposed to either stimulate or slow down an economy. So here we are back in 2007 and we're keeping about, as a central bank, keeping about 800, 900 billion dollars worth of treasury bonds on deposit. And that helps reserve requirements and various things that the Fed has to do. And then we had a bank crisis. Remember that one, 2008? And so we started moving along and the, the Federal Reserve Bank does something unusual. They start holding the treasury bonds <clears throat> that they use, that we use to back the currency so that the currency is worth something. So, that, so now those bonds, a lot of them are being held at on deposit at the Federal Reserve Bank. And there's some, some benefits for the country, the government, to be able to have them hold it versus selling it to somebody who wants an interest payment, as an example. So then we moved up to 4.4 trillion and we kind of slowed down in October of 2014. Flattened out, we're not really buying any more bonds and leaving them on the, the balance sheet at the Federal Reserve, we're actually starting to drop down and then boom, COVID hits and off to the races we go. And now there's $7 trillion worth of currency and what have you, uh, bonds primarily, treasury bonds on deposit at the Federal Reserve because they created more dollars to stimulate the economy. 
So a lot of dollars running around in here. Uh, not trying to give you an economics lesson, but I am saying uh, this, this could be a little funky sometime in the future. As far as panicking today, don't. We can handle it, but we can't handle it forever. And so one day, somebody's going to have to repay these bills. So when you look at a stock market, and I'll use the S&P because everybody likes that one, and we look over the last 10 years since we've had that money print, that explains why this market has moved up so significantly. If you remember, I said they stopped printing money. They started way back in here, and then they stopped uh, October of right, right here. That's their stop date. That was October of 2014. Flattened out for a while, and then off, off it went again. So you can kind of, if you remember what I showed you on the balance sheet of the uh, Federal Reserve Bank, this kind of mimics that a lot. When it seems like when there's money infused into the economy, things perk up again. Sort of like an IV in a patient. You give them an IV and they, they feel a little better, but you can't live on the IV forever. So just a little worrisome. Uh, a lot of people are saying to me, let's, let's kind of trim it back a little bit and wait until after November the 3rd or November the 15th, whenever they finally come up with who the president and the Senate is and the House of Representatives and all that sort of stuff, whoever wins majority. And I can understand why you would do that. So no arguments out of me. Conservative probably is okay for a little while. And then we have to get back to the business of business. And that, that means investing in profitable businesses. So again, that's what the US economy is all about. Uh, that's what the stock market's all about, owning profitable businesses. So don't, don't worry too much. Just understand that the world is a little different uh, because of uh, some of the manipulations from the government and the Federal Reserve Bank and those types of things. And I wanted to make you aware of them. All right, so th this is pretty much it for this month. If you have questions, feel free to give us a call. Our number is 336-448-1086. We can help you to make some sense out of some of these things. And if you're worried about taking too much risk or being too conservative, these are things that we can uh, take a little bit of time and, and, and hopefully uh, help you to, to come to a, a level of confidence where you can invest with confidence and feel comfortable about your future. Uh, make it uh, a good month and we'll see you sometime around uh, post-election.